Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin for the second time on Dev Talks. Left and General PJS Panu, who's going to tell us about the space. Now, space is a very, very large subject, as it is uh, a very large space itself. But there is a certain application that goes into space, which is which is connected to the military, apart from ISR and so on and so forth. There's a these the vastness of space is also basically the vastness of the subject of the application of space within our lives today. So thank you so much uh, for joining me. And I'd like to tell the viewers that uh, uh, General was actually one of the people who was the person who started the space and the cyber agency within the country. And he's been involved uh, with this particular thing. I've read some of his articles. Uh, fantastic, sir, sir. Thank you so much for joining in and ho hoping to learn from you what is space all about. Uh, thank you, Adi. Very happy to be here once again with you. And I'm uh, uh, very happy that you also pick up uh, very relevant uh, subjects, which are not only current, but I think space per se has a great future. Uh, it'll be debated and uh, the entire globe is going to be impacted uh, by any applications, uh, both military and civilian. Uh, it is going to touch our lives. Uh, more and more in the future. So I'm very happy to be talking about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you indeed. Now, I'd like to take us back into a little bit of history where during after the Second World War was the time where, uh, if I may say, space exploration began. And once the exploration began, of course, the militarization had to take place because they were we were at a Cold War sort of a situation. The world was it. Uh, a lot was spoken in those days. And if you go, you, you hear Star Wars and this and that and the other. But leaving that aside, sir, I just want to know from the status of space during the Cold War and the application of space during the Cold War, what has changed from then to now uh, within this sector, sir? Um, Adi, during the Cold War, we know that there were two, two superpowers, basically. Mm -hmm. And these two superpowers were investing hugely into space. Uh, the other players were there in a very, very... Um, secondary manner that they were doing some amount of research and they wanted to use applications which are uh, for development purposes and for well-being of mankind. Uh, in fact, space is a, a, a global common. Space can be utilized by anybody because any satellite which you throw up in the orbit actually covers the entire Earth. So therefore, any country which throws a satellite uh, you cannot have that the satellite is only available to you over your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, private space. There is no national space above 100 kilometers. Above the carbon line, it is a uh, common line. It is all uh, global common. So the lower Earth orbit and the medium Earth orbit technically make the satellites go around so fast that they cannot be used at static locations to keep a surveillance or any activity uh, which is, um, you know, um, what do you say, uh, is host or it is not private to a place. It, it goes around and around. So therefore, any global activity is possible. It is only when you throw up a satellite which becomes geosynchronous or um, uh, it is geostatic. So geostationary are the ones which actually are put over the equator, which relatively look static over your own point. So it covers about 40 percentage of the Earth, uh, one satellite. Uh, these are the ones which don't go around uh, in a relative way, but all satellites go around. So a satellite which matches the speed of the rotation of the Earth looks relatively stable, and therefore they can be geosynchronous or geostationary, but all in the LEO and the MEO, that is the low Earth orbit and the medium Earth orbit, they have to go around. So they, it becomes uh, global. And any payload that you put on it is the one which makes the satellite perform differently. So the use cases change depending on the payloads that you put on these satellites. That's interesting. As a matter of fact, uh, it will benefit the users to know geostationary satellite. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth? Yes, 36,000 kilometers, approximately 35,500 above. Uh, when they go around, uh, they are so adjusted that they look relatively uh, positioned uh, at the same spot as the Earth moves. 
and uh, therefore uh, they can be used uh, for any purpose, largely communication, but any other purpose is also depending on the uh, the transponders and the sensors that you fit on it. There's a lot of improvement which is taking place. So therefore the use cases also continue to change depending on how the technology is evolving. That's interesting, sir. So we spoke about communication and uh, the military aspect of it is something that I'd like to look at. Uh, the criticality of this 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 avenue was actually seen for those of us who were who were uh, monitoring the Russia Ukraine war right from the beginning. We saw that communication links kind of got cut off for the Ukrainians in the beginning, and then Starlink came in and kind of uh, did a little bit work, and now they've got a lot of uh, actually a pretty good communication system within Ukraine. Uh, has the understanding of utilization of space with these private players and so on and so forth changed, especially after this configuration which is happening in Europe, sir? Uh, hugely, uh, there is a change as the civilian application is put to dual use, which can be put to military use in any case. Any satellite which is actually thrown up into an orbit, nobody really understands what it is going to do. Uh, uh, there is no green paint or OG paint on it to, to say that it is a military satellite. Uh, it will perform how we want make, to make it perform. Uh, in particular, when you're talking about the Ukraine uh, operations, the Russians started targeting the earth stations and the infrastructure of Ukraine, making sure that none of the landing stations of their satellites are functional. So when you're talking about the warfare, really speaking, uh, the warfare can happen from satellite to satellite. That is one way of neutralizing the adversary's uh, space. Uh, it means nothing is happening on ground. It is one satellite sorts out another satellite. And there are various ways of doing it. These are called counter space technologies. Uh, or if you want to shoot a satellite, you can also shoot the satellite with a missile, which is anti-satellite operations that India also tried uh, yes. and tested. Uh, in 2019 uh, as Operation Shakti. Uh, as far as Ukraine is concerned, number of things happened. One is that one would never know uh, what was the counter space um, uh, strategy used by the Russians, uh, which they could have used. But more importantly is most of the earth stations were destroyed. Once the Earth station is uh, knocked out, then there is nothing that the satellite can do because ultimately it requires landing points. So initially, this is what happened. But uh, Elon Musk, with his Starlink, very quickly started providing the links to it. So he started giving number of units, which is number of ground stations, which are mobile ground stations, he started supplying to them. Uh, initially, you know, he supplied about 4,000, and then it came down to 12,000. And then I'm told that now 25,000 link stations are available for the Ukrainian military. It means the situational awareness of military is so good because Starlink is actually giving broadband uh, facility anywhere, and the capacities are huge. So once you have the internet coming from the satellite, you can use internet uh, for any, you, know, you can download videos, you can speak, you can send data, uh, you can even control the uh, space by matching a shooter sensor, which is another matter because there are many other things have to go into that. So largely, it was the situational awareness and command and control of the Ukrainian forces, even at the tactical level, became so high that in front of them, the Russian army started looking very flat footed, because they ran out of it because they did not have those capacities and the Ukrainians could really maneuver their forces in small detachments and get better of them because they had such a high situational awareness. That's an interesting development looking at the fact that uh, till very recently space was thought to be impregnable in terms of uh, counter military adventures or or pregnable or you know uh, by only anti satellite operations which very few countries have. Uh, this is an interesting perspective which is coming out that there is a vulnerability there as well. So there has to be some sort of Backups. We'll discuss that in a bit, sir. But I want to get into India, where I want to ask you what are the main priorities of the Indian uh, space program? Not not really, uh, basically the civilian and military space programs. And of course, a lot of the viewers would want to know that are we well covered as far as space is concerned? Because we see a lot of news about uh, domestic Indian satellites being shot into space. ISRO is doing a damn good job. Uh, 
in terms of its uh, finances, in terms of its efficiency. So how do you kind of, uh, you know, uh, how would you like to describe to us or share with us what the Indian space sector is all about and the military wise, are we fully covered? Uh, you used the terminology coverage, whether, whether we are well covered. So you're talking about space coverage or satellite coverage. Now, it depends on the use case that you're talking about. Yeah. If you're talking about satellite communications, then the number of satellites which you throw up, uh, whether they are in a constellation working together or there are a number of them moving around in the low Earth orbit, then you require lower the orbit, you require more number of satellites. And therefore, though you have better efficiency, but the cost also goes up because you have to throw out satellites which are by thousands. In fact, Elon Musk is planning to have about 40 odd uh, thousand satellites or 42,000 uh, satellites to be precise, which are going to be on the uh, low Earth orbit. He wants to cover the entire globe by making sure that the world gets the Starlink broadband connectivity, uh, which is going to be seamless, uh, zero latency, always available. There is huge amount of redundancy. So that is the kind of coverage which certainly is not there. You know, when he's talking about 40,000 uh, or 42,000 satellites today, the number of satellites which are actually there in the orbit cannot be counted because the number of launches which have happened, you can only say about 8,000 satellites are available. In Out of that, only 4,500 are functional because every satellite has a life. A satellite which has been launched will continue to perform till the time it dies off the batteries or it ages to a point or it loses its orbit and becomes a uh, debris. But it never, uh, you can never say that the satellite has disappeared from the space. So uh, about 8,000, 8,500 satellites up, only 4,000, 4,200 functional uh, are the ones that cannot provide adequate coverage to the entire globe, whichever country you're talking about. Now, relatively, the Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese have got some amount of coverage which GPS, uh, if you really look at now, GPS uh, works on different orbits put together. The the uh, Mio about thirty six satellites moving around. Uh, it gives a coverage, but not uniformly. So there is a restricted area coverage which he gives it. The Americans give it to their own military, and there is an open area coverage which uh, gives you that kind of accuracy, which is okay for normal civilian application. Similarly. Uh, GLONASS is there, um, Baidu is there of China, uh, which is also being used by Pakistan. So yeah. really speaking, Baidu between China and Pakistan are a huge deterrent to us because they are the PNT satellites. And PNT satellites mean that if they want to have a shooter sensor link or they want to have navigation for military navigation or for other commercial purposes, uh, they will be well covered together. As far as we are concerned, we have our own IRNSS. Uh, we should have had uh, 11, but only nine are functional. Actually, we've come down to seven now. Uh, so these kind of satellites, which are available for giving you position, uh, time, and navigation, uh, these are the satellites which are very important for uh, navigation. And these are the satellites which are also important to giving you accuracy in shooter sensor process. So therefore, uh, accuracy to fight a war which gives you a very precise targeting is extremely important. So there are three large areas, use cases. One is communication, PNT, and the uh, ISR. These are the three things put together, bring the space sector together to give you good resolution, good uh, navigation, and good uh, communication, which are all interlinked to making them usable for military purposes and even for civilian purposes. So most of the space sector is actually dual use. It all depends on if your resolutions are better, then you start calling them military grade. If your uh, positioning is better, the resolution is better in PNT also, you can start calling them military grade. But largely more accuracy, more resolution, uh, zero latency, Better security is what makes it military. Otherwise, it can all be put to dual use. But isn't there a fight with regards to resolution and the scope always? Uh, the scope of the area that you can cover? Um, 
when you are putting a satellite on a lower orbit, it moves relatively that much more faster. Sir. And the swath it covers is also that much more narrower because it is now too close to the Earth. As you keep increasing the altitude, it means now you're going on the higher orbit, it can give you a larger swath. But the resolution will be uh, bad because it has actually gone away from the Earth. So if you want to have a lower Earth orbit, it will give you better resolution, but it will cover lesser swath. So you need to throw more number of satellites into the orbit to give you that kind of a coverage. And that makes the whole process so expensive. And now imagine a satellite can move so fast that every 20 minutes it can come back on the LEO orbit back to the same place. But by then the Earth has shifted because of the rotation. So it means even though the satellite is repetitively, uh, repetitively coming back to the same spot, but the spot has changed because the, <laughs> the Earth has rotated. Yeah. So therefore, for the, next, uh, uh, for the next coverage, you need to have other satellite moving there. So you have to have number of satellites moving, which is uh, absolutely unaffordable. Uh, so therefore, only the rich or you can have collaborations so either you are well connected diplomatically that you can actually get all the downloads from elsewhere. Whoever else has got that information can give it to you through analytics or even raw information to you. Otherwise, it is very uh, difficult for one nation to invest so much of money only for military purposes. So therefore, it has to be loaded with multi-sensors so that it is, if we are not at war, at least those satellites, which are in any case uh, uh, going around in the orbit, uh, would be yielding some, you know, in the supply chain, giving you a full value of it. So uh, that is a big challenge uh, as far as Indeed. military versus civilian application, the cost is concerned. That's that's quite a myth buster, sir, because at the end of it, uh, you know, in common knowledge, and this is something uh, which I'd like you to clarify with regards to the perception of space, the common knowledge is always, yeah, it is a satellite, why do you not see it? Why is it happening? And all that stuff. Uh, is it even possible to cover our borders? Let's just talk about that. 24-7, 365 with the satellites that we have, or any country ha has for that matter. Uh, it is possible if you are going to throw in the kind of satellites that I was talking about. So if you're going to have 40, 50,000 satellites on the LEO uh, going around with that kind of a lower orbit, and, uh, and then you are not at war, so you're picking up everything that you need, uh, who's going to pay for it? Uh, you can keep finding out whether the tank is still there or not, or the tank has moved to another place, and every day you can monitor that. But at what cost are you monitoring? So therefore, therefore, those kind of budgets cannot be afforded by anybody. So the number of satellites which are, as it is, gathering this information are available all over the world, but it is not easy for you to decide from who to take that information because you don't want to trust anybody else external to you to give you that information. So therefore, if you got to put some amount of satellites to your satisfaction, it is not easy that it will keep the same place under observation all the time. So therefore, when you talk about ISR, really speaking, you have to do large amount of reconnaissance. When you do large amount of reconnaissance, then you decide which is the area you want to keep under surveillance. And then you start concentrating on those areas and you keep under surveillance. And once you have collected your data, uh, that this is what your surveillance results are, and that is how it becomes intelligence. So, so it is a process. You cannot, you cannot have one satellite or a couple of satellites giving you intelligence because it means nothing. You have to have a larger reconnaissance uh, you know, area which you want to see. And wherever you suspect, then you start going deeper into that and start keeping certain areas into more surveillance. And therefore, you might like to invest more there. So some amount of tilt is also required that you tilt the, um, the satellite to a point that it is naturally giving you the same swath, but in the next tilt, it will give you the same swath, but it is actually going somewhere else. Uh, so a huge amount of effort is required to manage all that from the Earth stations to program those satellites. And they also consume uh, power. They also consume, I mean, they have limited life. So you can't use, keep moving these satellites and keep changing their orbits and keep changing their direction uh, because you're also losing the life. 
um, it is a little more complicated than that. So, um, so to say that you cannot keep every square kilometer under observation all the time, unless you do the kind of investment that I was talking about earlier. Unless, I mean, unless it's practically possible, which is a <clears throat> interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, so it depends, you know, maybe, maybe after 30 years, practical uh, benchmarks will also shift. Uh, yeah. Because if you can, you can keep throwing so many satellites every year because you can only do number of launches. Every launch costs huge amount of money. And if a launch fails, imagine so, so much of money which goes down the drain. You know, uh, uh, last week what happened that um, the Airbus satellites, uh, both of yeah. them lost because they, they could not reach the orbit. Uh, the billions of dollars have been sunk because one is that the cost of launch itself was so much, the cost of satellite was so much, and the cost which you had actually created infrastructure that you would do business with these satellites also actually uh, becomes meaningless. Uh, so these are the kind of losses which are there. I don't think so. Insurance companies are ready to uh, <laughs> cover all those kind of losses <laughs> which the space sector can make. But it is very important that uh, Elon Musk has an advantage that most of his launches have been successful. Uh, in fact, yes, sir. largely. Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah. maybe if there are some not successful, he doesn't talk about them much and he talks more about it because Elon Musk is a very different person. Uh, obviously, his personality study itself is a case study by itself. <laughs> but, oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But a maverick in space, sir, there's no question about it. Uh, uh, what I want to kind of ask you is about the factor that the way that we are set up in India, sir. Uh, I mean, you, I, I gave, I, I spoke about your uh, being involved within the space agency. Uh, what is the kind of uh, prerogative that has been set up for this agency? Uh, we've got the ISRO as well. Uh, so is this a military specific setup or is this a combination of a military civil sort of a setup? And what are the priorities and how does this, this agency function, sir? Uh, to begin with, really speaking, ISRO is basically a research and development organization in space. It's a research organization to begin with. Now, once you have invested huge amount of money in research, then for them to uh, transfer that research and develop something else is so much more time consuming. Uh, so what they did was they started expanding to uh, companies which were actually uh, another arm of ISRO, and they started manufacturing uh, the launch vehicles, uh, of course, with collaboration from countries and collaboration with many uh, other, you know, uh, partners in the industry. Uh, but at the end of it, all that was being done as job work by the ISRO and ISRO owns the launch uh, facilities and ISRO also manufactures a number of satellites. But the mandate of ISRO is actually peaceful and uh, civilian use. It is not military use. Uh, but as I said, that it all depends on the payload that any satellite carries. And I said that if a satellite is being launched, you cannot say from the shape of the rocket or the shape of the satellite or the color of the satellite and what is going to do. It is only those who have loaded the payload and who have built the Earth stations, only they know that this satellite is going to go into this orbit and this is the kind of payload it is carrying for the purpose of what, what they're going to deliver on ground. So for, for many reasons that the number of applications which the satellites were used for some of uh, some of them uh, was possible to be used by the military but the resolution which is required for normal application uh, may not be of military grade so therefore military has over a period of time and that is why we built a space agency which ultimately should become space command uh, would be to make sure that isro stroke drdo uh, is support uh, is supported uh, in a manner that it starts giving military its requirement. And so it will have its own earth stations, which uh, some earth stations are already there, which are purely military. Uh, certain satellites are going to be thrown up, which are purely uh, for military communications. Uh, certain satellites would also be there, which are going to be used for ISR. Uh, so depending on what orbit, depending on what use case you want. Uh, while I said that most of them can be put to dual use, but better resolutions and better results which are required. Say, for example, if you want to uh, have identification 
uh, of threat. Uh, what is that you want to pick up? Do you want to pick up a road or you want to pick up a bridge? Is that your intention? Because infrastructure uh, uh, can be detected uh, by uh, you know lower resolutions. You can make out that the uh, you know the road is being built or there's a bridge coming up and this is the alignment or a railway line. But if you want to pick up a tank or a vehicle or a soldier for that matter, uh, it becomes very difficult. You have to really bring down the resolutions to about 30 millimeter. But then if it is to be in color, uh, then it the same resolution becomes that much more bigger because you know if you want to have it, you want to see it in color, uh, then uh, same becomes 1.2 meters if it is 30 centimeter. So, so therefore, uh, it is a challenge how you want to bring better resolutions, which gives you a very clear indication of exactly what is it? Is it a tank or a vehicle? Uh, whether it is the same tank or the same vehicle which has moved, or this has disappeared and the new one has emerged. Uh, so I think that requires huge amount of investment because to keep certain area under surveillance all the time requires effort of the kind that we have spoken about it initially. And Space Agency is actually laying down the requirement which is required for military use, whether it is PNT or it is communication or it is ISR, all put together. In fact, even the Space Situational Awareness, SSA, uh, what is that which is important for us? Uh, when you talk about space warfare, really space warfare is most misunderstood because if satellites have to feed, uh, fight satellites, uh, that is space warfare. But what the space can be used for, for ground operations, is space warfare, which is actually space-supported warfare and space-enabled warfare. Because the warfare is actually happening on ground. It is not happening mm -hmm. on space. If the impact of whatever is sent on space is on ground, which is communication, PNT, ISR, and you want to do internet of battle things or internet of military things, uh, it means you are actually being supported by space. And space warfare uh, technically means that the satellites are sorting each other out in the space, and you will never understand what is happening there. So therefore, a huge amount of money is being invested in space situational awareness. You know that <laughs> it, it it brings me back to the Reagan years when when they were talking about uh, space launch, multiple uh, you know uh, forehead vehicles, MIRVs, and this and that and so on and so forth. The idea of space has been kept open all this while. Sir. We've not had you know borders being made into space, and that's something which is encouraging till now. But when you talk about space wars, uh, wouldn't that create a certain amount of uh, control issues within space because looking at uh, let's say a global hegemon that will want to keep its control over a large section of space so that it can operate with it uh, Adi um, it cannot be done it is a global common and uh, you would have read in one of the articles I wrote very recently that the moment you throw up a satellite it goes into uh, an orbit it becomes a global asset when I say global asset, it means now it can start performing globally. So if your country is very small, it will give you the coverage of your country as a very, very small portion of what it can do. So largely, when the satellite goes around, it can be used for communication, ISR, PNT, anywhere in the world. So if you have to realize the full value chain of the investment, then you have to make sure that your through global diplomacy and global business, which kicks in here, is that how many stakeholders and how many users can make best use of space. So to say that you will mark territories over space, well, I can say that you can mark territories over the planets, uh, because that is, that is yet another paradigm uh, where you are doing planetary uh, exploration and I think the kind of planetary exploration which is going on is that they want to bring uh, now from the rare Earth materials, they've shifted to the rare planetary materials. And you've got to really dig uh, the surface of these planets and bring the materials down. And so much of research is happening. The Chinese have put um, uh, the lander on the other side, the darker side of the moon, Yatu. Uh, it is constantly sending signals of 
the minerals and the quality of soil, or maybe it is digging down a bit here and there and trying to find out what is there. So if they start transporting all that here, so in any case, Chinese have got most of the rare earth materials, they will also start stocking up uh, rare uh, planetary materials. Uh, they're also looking at uh, colonizing the moon. They're also putting the stations, which is the moon stations. Now, if you have a moon station, moon in any case is a satellite of the earth. So on the natural satellite, you put your own moon station, which will constantly keep looking at the earth. And the size of that station can be so big now that you don't have to really put another orbit or another satellite there because they will go and sit there on the moon and keep looking at the earth and you can make that that station on the moon do anything for you uh, for for the earth so there's going to be a very different shift in how the planetary exploration is going to work uh, towards how we do our uh, business on ground as also uh, how we capture those uh, planets and maybe uh, the time will tell how we will become lunar and uh, you know um, also occupants of mars because these are the two uh, planets we have occupied uh, in a manner of interference and landing. It's amazing when we talk about human beings actually occupying because the last time when we went went up and went, stepped foot on the moon was 1972, I think the last mission that went went across. I think 68 uh, or 69, yeah. 69 was the first landing on the moon and uh, after that, yeah, yeah five yeah. missions. So, uh, so... Which brings me back to India. We, we are now talking about uh, sending our own astronauts uh, through our own this thing. I believe there was some I, unsubstantiated, uh, I won't call it a rumor, news that came out that these guys are on the second phase of their training and this and that and the other. Leaving that aside, sir, what is India's plan for space, let's say, in the next decade? Uh, we've got China as a big threat. We've got a collusive threat with Pakistan, of course, as you very clearly elucidated that both of them use uh, have a sharing agreement in terms of the systems. How do you see India not just countering this, but trying to actually build up its own game within space in the next uh, decade, sir? Apart from, uh, so I'd like you to kind of answer it in civilian and military terms, sir. Um, what these countries have done, I'm talking about the uh, US, Russia, China put together that they have been building these space labs. Uh, China, of course, now I think they have put the third module and the fourth is going. Uh, yeah. Um, so the space lab is going to remain there in the orbit and there are going to be uh, human beings who are going to be carried as astronauts, cosmonaut, cosmonauts, and whatever you can talk about. That these people will go and occupy these labs and they will do certain experiments there. Because it is an ideal place to do certain are not possible on the earth because of uh, the nature of earth that you know there's pollution here there's gravity here it's not perfect vacuum so a lot of r d would happen in the international space labs and the space labs owned by these countries um as far as india is concerned we have been planning for gaganyan for some time uh, basically it requires a shuttle uh, once the shuttle is there it carries uh, the number of you know two or three uh, astronauts uh, into the space and uh, they can also stay there for uh, maybe a day or a few hours and come back uh, but the launch itself is complicated because you have to bring them down safe uh, so therefore landing missions or the reusable ro rockets are the ones which are being spoken about uh, how the landing is achieved is also another matter. So therefore, for last number of years, the selection process has been on and the training has been on and uh, they are being taught as to how they should uh, uh, program themselves and how they should train themselves because uh, a lot of physical, mental uh, resilience has to be uh, brought into them through training and also how to operate a shuttle, how to operate many things in the space are the ones that they are going to be spoken about. But this program has uh, been postponed uh, because I think it is not only the rocket shuttle combination, but also the landing uh, part, uh, which is being fine tuned. Uh, I suppose maybe next year, we would know exactly when they are doing this program because it was supposed to be done uh, last year 
then it got postponed. And uh, I suppose we should be able to send uh, a human being into the space, uh, into our own shuttle, uh, which uh, I'm told they are uh, working on. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the advanced version of what SpaceX is talking about, he has been talking about transporting uh, troops uh, from one place on the Earth to the other place on the Earth through the space. Uh, that is, of course, air transportation of troops, which can also have happen at some point, air transportation of not troops, but uh, it can also make you reach uh, uh, US in just a few hours or not even, or maybe just about an hour that, you know, you just go into the space and travel so fast and you land up there, uh, which no, no other aircraft can uh, would ever be able to match, but the cost is going to be huge. Yeah. Those are the experiments which are going on. Um, as also... Uh, what is being looked at is that when you talk about missiles, you know, hypersonic missile is something which goes into space. Uh, in the weaponized version, there are a lot of things in the space which might surprise us. You know, there are robotic arms which the satellites carry. Uh, they do the recovery and they do the repair on site. Uh, the satellite is not behaving. So you imagine another satellite coming very close to it comes to proximity. It can do surveillance. It can download your communication. Uh, if it comes so close, it can even destroy you because mm. either it can steal information or it can recharge your batteries or the robotic arm can start repairing. So if these are the kind of satellites, some Chinese have got those robotic arms, they can also come and put your satellite into a spin. Uh, imagine that you send, send out a satellite and after some time your satellite doesn't function because another one in the proximity comes and starts tweaking it through energy or directed energy weapon can be used. Uh, so th those are the counter space, uh, uh, you know, technologies which are being used. So uh, actually China has overtly spoken about usage of space for military purposes in the doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are the ones who have invested hugely into quantum computing, quantum communication through space. Uh, they are the ones who are heavily investing into stealing of information and manipulating your satellites in space. Uh, so therefore, I was talking about, you know, imagine a robotic arm and turning your satellite around and you won't know what happened because unless you have your own space situation awareness, you don't know which is the other satellite in proximity coming in, uh, playing very hard. Also, what is uh, being suspected is, at the moment, I can only talk about suspect because uh, suspicion because... Uh, nobody really has proven it, that from the space, they are keeping under surveillance, I'm talking about primarily Chinese, of your preparations to launch, because all your launch sites are being monitored. And imagine if there is a satellite which is to be launched, they can start manipulating the same rocket or they can start using electromagnetic uh, you know, force in whichever way in application uh, by making sure that your satellite doesn't function. Uh, the moment it reaches the orbit. So imagine you spend a huge amount of money and you find either your rocket has not attained the requisite orbit, or once the satellite was put into orbit, uh, it has started dimming out, uh, or it starts losing its own orbit. Uh, these are the kind of things which are very important for us to understand that that is space warfare, but uh, since there would be no body bags brought home, so you don't know it is a war going on. <laughs> uh, uh, we feel that uh, when there is war, you know, when mothers cry, they know that, you know, this is what happened. You can't, can't keep it hiding. But what happens in the space, uh, nobody would ever understand. So we are constantly at war as far as space is concerned because it is like Siachen Glacier, whether the bullets are being fired or not, you are at war because you've got to sustain mm -hmm. it. And you have to sustain that kind of a space environment which is getting tougher by the day. Imagine the number of satellites which are being thrown in. Many people are talking about if the space is over congested. And if space is over congested with about 8,000 odd satellites, what about these 42,000 which are going to be in the LEO per se? Uh, and imagine if the kind of debris uh, which would get into thrown into space is another matter. Who's going to clear the de debris? So people are talking about that there will be satellites, you know, who would. Uh, uh, Become scavengers, collecting satellites, yes, sir. collecting satellites and all that, uh, but it will certainly have impact on the earth. So mm -hmm. I think, indeed, sir. 
indeed indeed yes, it's a scary yes. scenario when you put it like that you know because uh, the two agencies that you kind of help uh, build up cyber and space don't have any body bags as per se but the impact of them are uh, far beyond felt on a regular life and we saw that with the aims hack which happened recently that uh, of course a lot of conspiracy theories are going around why they did it it's also a possibility that to check systems and stuff like that whether you you can actually hit uh, uh, this thing this just sheer factor that this was done uh, tells you something of the vulnerability and it's not just us i think uh, two days later the chinese complained about one of their health systems being attacked by you know some anonymous hackers and stuff like that of course they point a finger at us or the us could often but these are things that are that are part of the game and this is something that we can understand we'll discuss cyber with you one some other day sir but thank you so much for this space talk uh i you know i i i'll again request you will will for if we could actually get into a little further detail about uh military applications not with with regards to how and what but with regards to what is the future of these applications uh in probably another segment sometime in the future uh but something that i've learned today is that space is an avenue which is which was a new avenue about 70 years ago and is still a very 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 new avenue which very very few people understand uh one the capability of it and to the dynamics of it if i may say that and that's something i learned from your discussion uh because the loose nature of the discussion with regards to space and its capability tells us that the understanding is not really there amongst the common folk uh it's about hai to se laga dete hain chala dete hain Uh, needs to be a little further refined and probably an understanding of how these systems actually work would be of help for us to as common indian citizens to understand what are the threats and what are the potentials of this particular field of warfare if i may sir thank you so much as always it's a pleasure interacting with you sir and thank you for the articles it was an eye opener uh, help me to understand a lot of other things i uh, request the viewers you can actually you know uh, not do anything else just go to the uh, google type lesson general pjs pannu and space and you will start get, seeing his articles and his talks uh watch this one and of course the other ones as well uh you will be able to read all that stuff so you know if you want a little further base into our discussion today that will be great sir thank you so much as usual uh for discussing this wonderful subject with me uh thank you uh, adi i wanted to keep it simple not use too much of jargon uh, sometimes it is difficult to speak simple Uh, because space uh, brings That's in a lot of jargon it. in it so i was constantly staying away from using of jargon but i suppose uh, in simple manner i think when we talk about space we are talking about impact on human lives mm-hmm. good bad or ugly for the future we have to live with that so if you have to live with that i suppose earlier we start investing time energy and resources into space better it is for the nation yes, for us absolutely and to the viewers i am I, i you know a lot of us will write in the comments adi why didn't you ask the question of the private space program purposely not because there's a whole another discussion and i don't want to amalgamate with it with a basic understanding of what space is so that's that's a different discussion for another day so guys just hold your horses for the minute we will get back to you about private space use and the stuff that india is doing today some inspired stuff that india is doing today sir thank you so much and jai hind thank you jai hind dadi what a pleasure talking to you thank you sir